mess me up because Joe just clown. He gets funny. He laughs when I say good evening. <laughs> Welcome to um, Breaking Bread. Uh, happy, happy to be here again. We kind of had a bit of a hiatus. For those that watched the last one, we took the last one off because went to the Beyonce and Jay-Z concert, which was, for those that haven't saw it yet, it's still an amazing show. Um, as we do, share. Um, I know there's a couple people that are anxiously watching this one, so I am going to attempt to share it without telling on myself. What I always do, Alicia, um, is sometimes I have the volume playing into like a rookie mistake, so like the going <laughs> joke now. Um, so, um, so we have a new person to join the table, which I'm super, super excited about. I will let her introduce herself, but I'm super stoked to see she joined. <laughs> I'm Alicia Godfrey. I'm a former work colleague of Rob's. Yes. Yes. So, and as you know, Joe, who's always here, and I'm Rob, um, so no surprises there. <laughs> so tonight's conversation, um, we wanted to do something timely. Um, it's back to school time. Um, in a couple weeks here in Ohio, schools will be starting up. Um, there's been a whole lot going on in the new circuit about LeBron opening up his I Promise School. So we wanted to have a conversation on education. Um, so that's kind of the topic at hand. So for those that are watching or watch on playback, um, definitely contributes to the conversation. There's a couple things that we kind of want to hit today. Um, so just kind of provide you kind of the skeleton of the conversation. Um, we want to start with kind of establishing what is the value of education, um, if there's value, um, and what role do we believe education plays um, under the mantra of success, what does success look like. Um, then, once we kind of establish what role education plays within kind of the value system, why is LeBron, I guess before I go there, do we believe that everybody has the same access to education? And then we'll end it with the why is LeBron opening a school outside of LeBron being, you know, the Akron hometown kid, yada, yada, yada. But why is it a big deal to have him opening the school? So to kind of start it off, Joe, what, what do you think about education and kind of what's your value system? And, and to make it real, so what is your personal story when it comes to kind of education and what has education meant for your narrative? I believe, for me personally, I am on the tail end of like the industrial revolution of the concept of education. So it Meaning, benefited me okay. because I was able to go through um, formal learning, mm -hmm. which allotted me the ability to get a job. Okay. But do I believe education is valuable for today? Meaning formal learning, um, and is it necessary? And is it actually adding value to people's lifestyles? I, I think it depends on industry. I think it depends on vocation or career. Okay. But for me, uh, I did not get a job in the degree that I studied in. Mm -hmm. um, I did have to teach myself how to get uh, the skill sets that I've gotten now in order to do the job that I am currently working in. So in that sense, education taught me how to, I guess, learn, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily was it directly impacting my future. Does, okay. that, does that make yep. sense? Okay. Alicia, you want to share kind of your? Yeah, I have kind of a similar take, which is I think education or education as we have it today just teaches you what it shows when you get that diploma is that you can be trained, that you're trainable, um, and that you're wanting to learn something um, and then you go on into your vocation and you have to pick up all the skills whether it be people skills or hard skills in order to excel mm -hmm. at that particular vocation so I, I think I'm kind of in the middle of both of you I, I from the capitalistic standpoint um, I can't I don't think I would be living the lifestyle that I live had I not successfully completed my college degree. I don't think I would have been able to have the experiences that I've had, had I not had this sheet of paper. So I always kind of tell the story of, I have a degree from NC State, which I can't even tell you where it is currently in my house. Don't know where it is. But that single sheet of paper 
has afforded me the ability to travel the world more times than I can remember. I don't know if I, for free, meaning for free, meaning company is paid for me to go do work. So it's not like these are vacations, but I don't know if I would have had those same experiences had I not had a successful completion of obtaining that diploma. So for me, it's hard for me not to establish that there is value in it because again, it's been able to afford me a lifestyle that I'm comfortable with as well as the ability to do have experiences that I don't know if I would have had had I not obtained that sheet of paper. And is that, a, is it technical ability that you had to learn through a formal process or is it, um, it, it yeah, was it technical ability that, that I, your work, your job would say, yeah, you've you've gained knowledge on these technical skills, therefore you're qualified versus so no, so and I, I go with the no, um, and I apologize for those that might have heard me tell this story before. My first time traveling international was when I joined Victoria's Secret. Um, I joined Victoria's Secret in April of 2007. I went on my first trip to Asia in June of 2007. I hadn't even been there long enough to prove myself having the ability to do the job adequately or inadequately. But because I had a degree, now granted, I had to go through the interview process and I did everything to get the job. So the degree helped me get the opportunity to have the interview. I showed my capabilities within the interview, but I hadn't performed at that job before they booked me a ticket to go to Asia. Um, so again, and I will tell you, I worked at fashion and retail. That is not a unique opportunity to meet Rob Smith. It is the nature of the industry that I'm in and the part of the industry that I am. So I, I wanna be very clear that that isn't unique to just me. That is a nature of the role that I was in would require a trip to Asia. But I don't, I know for a fact, I wouldn't have been able to land that engineering role without having a degree from NC State. Good, and I, I can concur with that, but I will say, okay, so I went to Purdue University, but before I could graduate with my degree in hand in apparel design and technology, because that's what I studied, um, I had to have an internship, and I interned at Express, and that opened all the doors, because 99% of my classmates who had the same degree that I did got no job after college. And I had that internship on my resume, and that was like gold because I had the work experience. So I think they definitely go hand in hand. The education opened the door to the internship, which then definitely leads down the road. But had I not obtained the skills I had, the other doors in my career path probably wouldn't have opened. Yeah. It was definitely a combination of getting the degree and then um, networking. And I will go to your point earlier that I think every industry is different right so I, I always go to like the barriers of entry if, if i had a bank if i had a career in banking um <clears throat> outside uh, and i mean no shots at any i don't mean this with any disrespect outside of a hourly position i.e i would i would assume i never worked in banking so i'm, I'm making some broad assumptions here outside of a teller type of position i don't know if not having at least at minimum an associate's degree would allow you certain pieces and i think if you were to and again this is my speculation but if you're working in the law firm at minimum you have to be at least a paralegal right so i do think different industries have different barriers of entry in entry when it comes to education and that's what i think it is i don't know if it's necessary in the sense of someone can't learn without going to college or mm -hmm. someone can't self-study i believe it's just a level of res uh, respect right uh, or um i don't know if it's respect that's a bad a bad word uh yeah i guess someone will look at you like did you get a degree so yes, credibility. Credibility. credibility 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 okay from that standpoint yes mm -hmm. i know a few guys especially and again this day and age like development coding um um you know um uh, installation of websites yeah. and software and platforms yeah. i know a, a bunch of people that have taught themselves mm -hmm. that and are doing great things for rebar or, or cardinal health and yeah. even at discover mm -hmm. um but when it came to um like because i'm in, i'm in the financial services industry mm -hmm. i do design and financial mm -hmm. services but i'm also in hr so you could see how 
without a degree, in many cases, unless you your work mm -hmm. uh, was phenomenal, mm -hmm. the first thing someone will look at is, do we have a, did he finish his schoolwork? Yeah, did mm -hmm. he finish schoolwork? Okay, he didn't. No, pass on without even understanding if this individual is qualified mm -hmm. in the sense of knowing what to do. So, so I guess to I your, think it's just a credibility. Thing. So to your point, though, anything more than that. Without so as we kind of talk about the value of education, an education at least allows you the opportunity to showcase your abilities. Without having an education, you might have all the skills and competencies in the world, but that piece of paper kind of to Alicia's point, gives you the opportunity to at least showcase what you are. I think it's based on someone's perception, right? For sure. I, I got a degree from Timbuktu University that was <laughs> there's 300 people down the block. I graduated. Um, it's not a known brand. It's not a known school. I may have done great and hard work, but uh, versus Rob who went to North Carolina State. So I, so then you have that issue going yep, into, sure. into place. Um, but minimally, I believe it, it gives you that confidence that I completed work, and then it gives you the credibility. Okay. But that's not, that would be the only value, in, that's in my opinion. So as we kind of go to the second piece then, so I think what we can agree on is there is value depending on the role of the industry that you're going into. Could It could be weighted value, potentially. So access to education. And I guess if anybody here is chiming in, definitely let us know. Um, when it comes to access of education or giving, being afforded the opportunity to have equal access, do we believe that takes place in 2018? So let's not focus on Jim Crow era. So right. we, we, I'm not trying to say that that wasn't relevant in our history, but let's focus on 2018. Do we still believe that access to education is still a barrier um, to one having um, living their best life. So I think I, everyone has access. Everyone has access to a public school. In my opinion, you catch a bus, you can walk. You, you have the ability to, to, to get there, mm -hmm. but do you have access to a quality education? Okay. Is where I believe it. So what, how do you define quality? Good teachers, good books, good environment. We have schools in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, even in Columbus, where there's no AC in the building. You know I mean, in 2018, or I'll just say 2016, because I don't know, I haven't visited this school in, in a while. But in uh, in modern day, this school doesn't have um, um, AC. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hot outside, and they have windows open. It's hot, the books are tattered, um, no technology, no computers, maybe one in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So they have access to education, and then that school system uh, or public school couldn't pay for uh, quality teachers or anything. So that's what I mean. Okay. I just wanted to yeah, make sure. Yeah. Um, Thoughts? I don't think every child has equal access to great education. Yes, there's a building, like what you're saying. My mom was a public school teacher for almost well, 25, 30 years. And she taught in Northwest Indiana, but they considered it a suburb of Chicago. So, um, filled with uh, Hispanic immigrants and their families wanted nothing more than for those kids to do better. That's why they moved them to the United States. And there was just barrier after barrier. Either the kids didn't have food, so they were hungry during the day. The school didn't have air conditioning. They had old books. And then they would get money stripped away every year because their test scores were low. So it was just a recipe for disaster. So. No, I don't think every kid has the same opportunity as a kid who can go to private school mm -hmm. and get a low student-teacher ratio versus those who have to go to public school in a school system that's struggling. My kids go to public school, but they're in public school in Westerville, mm -hmm. and it's a really different environment, yeah. you know. No, I agree. So, I could again, just kind of make it live for us. When, when we made the decision to return back to Ohio, um, P and I, and we're committed and we're looking to buy a house <clears throat> because of trey location um became a big piece of that based upon the school system right um so by our our decision on where to buy a home and establish our roots was one of the major weighted variables was the school system and specifically not just the school system the specific elementary school that he would be going to because even within the, the Gahanna district where we live, all are 
good quality schools, but there are differences between. Um, so I, and then you often hear also, what is it, the zip code that you reside in has a direct impact on your ability to be successful, right? So kind of keeping all of that in mind, I, I by default know that there aren't consistencies when it comes to the quality of education. I even kind of go back to when I was in high school. I went to a high school that was majority one thing, um, and I had friends that went to high schools on the other side of the city in Charlotte, and they, they had experiences and were exposed to things that I never even, like, y'all doing that? <laughs> Um, so, so I do think in 2018 that there still are barriers and there isn't equal access um, to. Any comments out there? Cool. But I mean, there's access today. You have internet. You have. You assume that everybody has internet at home, though. We're at home. You assume have, the number of people that have a cell phone and the ability to pull up at a McDonald's and use free Wi-Fi or. I mean, but that, I guess that's to me the hustle. I, I'm also, that, that's the other half of it. Um, which is to me the difference between education and learning. You okay. know what I mean? Education versus learning is to me two completely different things. And when I look, actually looked up education on the internet, he said it's formal and it's imparting knowledge to, uh, through, through teaching. Mm -hmm. So that's educating. Uh, learning is informal and you're imparting knowledge through experience. Right, mm -hmm. which you learn while, while being educated, obviously, because you gain an experience mm -hmm. sitting in the classroom. Yeah. But there are many times where, like I said, uh, someone would sit down with me and say, hey, let me teach you how to take your cell phone, go to a McDonald's or library, mm -hmm. connect to the internet, and learn on lynda.com, mm -hmm. or learn on YouTube skill sets that could better you in society today. Mm -hmm. To me, that's not educational, that's just learning. Right, so um, so the availability of education and you having access to it, I think is much better now. Now, um, so you could have a public school, you could be stuck in one of those schools that don't have resources, so on and so forth. But if you had that hustle mentality or the learning mentality, I believe you could put yourself today in a position where you could learn or have access to somewhat of a better quality education than what someone's handed to you. Again, that's just an opinion. So, question. And I'm so, kind of playing devil's advocate just to try to, <laughs> no, to poke. No, so, but, 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 <laughs> yeah, so, kind of so let's stay there, though. <laughs> You're, let's, let's talk about, so if, if I kind of deduce what you said, it's really education is the formal piece and the learning is the application, right? So, really being able to create a degree. When you think about the the other barriers that can restrict you from the education piece, which then translates to the learning piece. So you speak about not having an air condition, not having transportation. Not so, food. so when you think about the other um, variables that can influence your ability to learn, ultimately, does so is it? I guess a twofold question: Is it not only the access piece, but unless you address some of the other variables that can influence your ability to learn? having access to it is not the problem because you won't be able to take full advantage of what you have access to if you can't if you're hungry yeah. which is a completely different right and we're yeah. just talking about education you know oh, we're yeah. over on the left side but if we're talking about you know the, the whole gambit yeah. you know not being able to eat my you know my mom the lights just got cut off, mm -hmm. cut off at the house or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be th then I'm in a position where even if I am in a quality education system educational system it would be difficult for me to learn so that I could apply those experiences. Okay. Yeah. So that's where a big disadvantage would be. I have a little different example. It's not quite so extreme. Um, my son has special needs, okay? And so he has to go to special education classes, and Westerville is great for that. We stayed in Westerville specifically because of that. But if I wanted to send him to private school, they would reject him because they want to keep their college admission rates super duper high because that's how they keep breaking in the mm -hmm. private school funding. So it's a system that I can't break him into even if I really wanted mm -hmm. to because they would say to us, 
we can't we don't have the programs to suit his special needs mm -hmm. and even private kindergarten i was going to send the kid to private kindergarten they said we can't do it because at the time he was english a second language so he couldn't they, they were like nope public school <laughs> and it's so, funny you said that because yeah. that the, the, that one of the definitions is process of receiving or giving systematic instruction and from a system standpoint i mean i think we all i mean that, that to deny someone the opportunity to have a, a quality or a private education because of special needs or whatever the situation may be because a system has been created that in order for me to receive more money in order to sustain a, a vision which is this business mm -hmm. I have to deny it well I don't have to but I choose to deny it, um, so that I can operate the system that feeds my family and or the kids that I have access mm -hmm. to that becomes the problem with me and the, the concept of education mm -hmm. and the concept of, of being able to learn. Well, I, I, I don't want to throw any particular university under the bus, so I won't say names. I think one of the things that I quickly learned as an adult, um, going back to work with different universities, is you recognize that education is a business, right? So when I think about um, universities that I've had the opportunity to partner with on different endeavors, whether it was um, for research pieces or just outsourcing different things based upon what that school is known for, you quickly understand that the, the, the business of education sometimes supersedes what they truly should be teaching students and exposing students to, right? So I, I, I think at the end of the day, it still is an institution that has to have profitability in order to create the platforms for people to be successful, right? So I, I remember having very specific conversations with professors talking about curriculum needs based upon me being in the industry saying, students are learning this, but these are truly the needs that I have for students coming out of university. Um, and almost engaging in direct opposition talk because the metrics of what we were each trying to do were different, right? So the university was more interested in having these sexy degree programs a la CSI type of roles, but you show me where those true industry business needs for those degrees are. So you get a kid that buys into this idea that I'm gonna be the next forensic whatever. But what you fail to tell them is there's only like three of those roles per state, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So you got a hundred kids buying in to a degree program. So for me, I'm long derailed there, but I think truly there is a business, an operation systematically where we have a staff, <laughs> we pay the staff a salary. In order to pay the staff a salary, we need to retain students, um, which kind of goes into a whole, whole thing. So. so so Tammy, Radiette, Jamie, Steven, do you do you believe that education is needed? Is that the, is that, is the first is, is there value mm -hmm. in education and is it, necess is it necessary in this day and age? I'd like to hear from you, let us know. I still believe that. See, now, I, I, so I listen to this guy. His name is Chris Doe, and he's a designer. I'm a designer. So I'm creative. <laughs> and, um, he is a firm believer that education in the, in the design industry is obsolete. You don't need it. You don't need it any longer. You just need a great portfolio, which you could learn how to build a portfolio, YouTube, mentorship, so on and so forth. And through that, you can prove your value mm -hmm. as a an independent contributor in an organization, get into that organization, learn its ways, its movements, and you could elevate, you know, through the industry that way. But he, he made a statement that I thought, and I kind of agree with it. He said, uh, college is now nothing more than uh, just loan officers. They're just trying to figure, they're, they're pretty much loan officers who uh, bring in customers, and connect them with banks, and not directly connect them with banks, mm -hmm. but link them to banks or have access to banks to give you a loan that you now have to pay back and I don't guarantee you a job. But we make money because you've given us 
you know, the loan and or grant and or, or I hear you, but going back to kind of how we started the conversation on establishing the value of those different degrees, whether it was for credibility or for exposure opportunity and access to things, there there is a return potentially on investment. Um, now, granted, it's upon the student, if you will, to choose wisely on what curriculum they might go into on what those opportunities might be. So do you believe the value is the degree or the value is the opportunity and your ability to present yourself in the field that you're in? Is it the degree by itself, which I disagree that it is the degree by itself? I believe it, it along with everybody else's degree, opened the door potentially because affirmative action could have opened the door for you also. And I don't, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but that could have opened. Your degree may have played a part, but hey, we need to have diversity in this in this um, space. So, sound like we might be having some technical. Is the mic not working? It was, it was working on me and on outside and it's not working. So, oh, okay. turn it off. So, give us can, some feedback if- um, Can you guys hear us? Can you hear us? I've got the solid red light. Um, so I, I say this to your question. I think it's kind of twofold. Um, I guess where's the value at? Is it in the education or is it? Well, I, I have another sorry, example. Sorry. I'm in real estate now. So I had to go and get an education in order to become licensed. The education that I got taught me absolutely nothing about being a realtor. Mm -hmm. It was just educating me in order to pass a test mandated by the state of Ohio so that I could then go out and practice real estate. So anything I've learned about real estate, I've learned in the last five years. But for me, I had to have that piece of paper because I have to be licensed and I have to take continuing education courses every three years, keep my, my stuff up in order to stay licensed. But if you talk to any of my clients, they're gonna tell you that they're working with me because of how I present myself and because of how I work with them, not because of the paper that I possess. And if they really knew what that paper, what it took for me to get that paper, they'd be like, oh my gosh well, you're great considering you got no education <laughs> because it, it doesn't. So I, I think it kind of goes all the way back to your original point was it depends on what field you're in because also having that corporate background, corporate doesn't open a door to anybody unless they have a college degree, mm -hmm. at least a four-year college degree. But if you're working in other fields, I think it, it opens a lot more doors to just uh, judging you based on your skills or how you present yourself and you can make a way for yourself in the world, especially if you have that entrepreneurial spirit that you were talking about and you, you're a go-getter and you can go after it on your own. But if, like what we were talking about earlier, if you're a kid who doesn't have the opportunities from an early age and you're never, you never see it modeled that to be a go-getter, mm -hmm. it just, I think it just stacks up against a person over time. Yeah. I think that for me, I think about it in two lenses. I think separating out the creatives and the creatives could be for me anything where you have the ability to formulate a thought and then have the ability to tangibly present that thought whether mm -hmm. it's be uh music whether it's be uh, art um i think that as a as a talent and a gift yes you can maintain a livelihood and i, I also lend that to the same trades associated right so to be a barber to be a plumber like you're learning a specific skill and then having knowledge of how to perform that skill um can provide you a livelihood um the piece that i separate out is if you don't have said talents or an abilities then i do think um education does play a more vital role because now you are contributing to another organization right um and i i even go to i thinking about the, the industry that i'm in there are certain so there are jobs that you can do within the industry that i in that i'm in that do not require a college degree right but those roles are limiting um and that's not to say could what we can't measure is what somebody perceives as a good quality life. So I'm um, say you can have a job and maintain a livelihood, 
to what level that quality of life is is up to your discretion but i think there are it becomes more challenging to expose yourself to additional opportunities without at least having say degree i think even though you have a degree though there isn't a guarantee of progression because i do right. think there at some point your work ethic has to match your education and i think to alicia's point unless you've been exposed to what a work ethic looks like it's hard for you to know how to model those behaviors and what that blueprint is and again i separate that outside of the creatives because the creatives i have the ability to create something and then i can sell my creation that can provide my livelihood or i've learned a trade a la a barber or whatever um but if, if i'm joe blow that doesn't have a special skill talent or ability then i do think the weight of an education becomes especially a formal education um becomes a little bit more um connected to how big is big and I'm not saying that everybody wants the same level of pie, piece of pie, um, but I do think there is a connection. Like it's hard, it's hard for me to say, and, and I'm gonna throw out the race piece. I don't know as a as a black man, I would be in the position that I'm in had I not had the formal training that I had. I could have been the biggest guru in in my field. I don't know as a black man I would have been able to present those skills had I not had the education piece. Had that so formal sheet of paper. A formality then? For sure. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And I think again, I'm and I Because I know to be successful in this system, American system, yeah. and I'm not just excluding it to America, but that's all I know, um, is that degree is a formality to have credibility in order to have access and, I, and I'm speaking and again I, I don't want to introduce race into that piece but it, it's hard for me to truly believe and, and I, I, I preface this by saying my points of comparison are friends that I have that don't have degrees um, that are just as smart as me probably more smart and more talented um, and not comparing lifestyles at all um, I've seen the opportunities that I've been afforded and I've seen some of the limitations that they've had because they didn't have some of the same credentials, if you will, that I have. And I'm not, I'm not smarter. I'm not more wittier. My hustle isn't like, I would argue that they probably hustle a little bit more than me because the grit is there out of necessity. Um, and not to say that I don't grind, but it's, it's, it's a different type when, it's almost, and this is going to sound terrible in my head, at least it sounds bad, we're playing two different games, right? Like, the, the game that I'm now challenged in navigating from a corporate structure, politically, I don't know if I would have been exposed to that game had I not had this sheet of paper. Man, so yeah, you, you, uh, you said a lot to me. You... Uh, I, I don't like the way you sound. It sounds like you're putting it all where you are all on that degree. I believe it's a small piece, but I just don't think that that's the all. I, I would like to believe that. As a black man, I don't know if I truly. Because, again, the difference between you and I is my merits, which got me there, aren't based upon my portfolio that I'm presenting. Right. I don't have a portfolio to show all the like my portfolio yeah, yeah, is my yeah. resume right yeah. and what and i say is probably true with doctors because you don't you can't create a portfolio you can't create proof of work as a doctor without learning how to cut how to pull yeah. how to you know so I I, I I i i can see that i can see it uh but it just rubs me it just rubs me yeah the wrong way. But anyway. so so kind of transitioning into kind of why lebron opening this school is a big deal so i think if we think about it from the value of education regardless so i guess before we jump on in the comments do we get feedback that people can hear us no we haven't gotten anything yeah anything, which is feedback unusual feedback about video feed is being interrupted but i don't know yeah that's that's for everyone that's the wi-fi unfortunately can't control that um 
the great thing is recording on a secondary device that once it goes to YouTube, it'll be better. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, LeBron, what did he do? Just for those that aren't aware, he has opened up a public school. He's partnered with the local Akron school district um, to open up a public school in Akron um, where they identified 240 at risk um, third or fourth graders. So there was a certain criteria that was established and students were randomly selected that met this criteria. Um, the ultimate goal of this program is starting off with third or fourth grade. It will ultimately conclude, I think, at eighth grade. So, so what I like about LeBron James, should we go just into the, keep talking about the yeah. topic? Or yeah, let's go. Providing at, or resources to at-risk families. Yeah. yeah. Is so, what's huge, and it actually gives them a chance to play in the system yep. that's already been created. Now, I've been one of those that hate the system, and when I say system, I'm not. I'm not talking like. Um, um, I don't think it's like a big brother like type system. I, I just look at it like there's just a way things are, get done around here. There's just you, you have to play. You have to play the game. <laughs> that sounds so bad, <laughs> but it's true. You you have to. Play. You have to play the game. Okay, mm -hmm. I just wanted to. <laughs> Mic check. I don't know. I'm, I'm going off of you. I mean, you have to talk, though, to yeah. be able to. We're going to have a song. Mic check. <laughs> yeah. I want that. So, well, unfortunately, if we have any problems, um, we know for a fact that YouTube version will be good, so we'll, we'll just kind of keep it going. Okay. Um, so, I agree. I think the other piece kind of to what LeBron is doing is taking, reducing all of those barriers. So, he's focusing not only on the students, but focusing on the families as well. So, I think, one, providing, taking any barriers that could make a child not be successful. He's taking care of the food piece. He's taking care of the the clothing piece, he's taking care of the transportation piece. Um, the extended day, you know, going from, I guess, going up to like five o'clock at night, minimizes the opportunity of the child finding themselves in situations that could potentially um, jeopardize. The fact that they are working with the parents for those that don't have high school degrees, GED classes, um, also assisting in job placement, I think also kind of helps in the quality of the family structure. Um, and then I think the ultimate commitment is the fact that any one of the students that successfully complete the I Promise program, um, he's partnered with the University of Akron and he's going to take care of the cost of their college education, so a full scholarship. So I think when you think about access to an education like that, um, and I think the thing that really stood out to me is the criteria of these students to be selected to the program is they had to be, their test scores had to be behind where the other students were. So if I'm in the third grade, and I'm gonna say use reading, I'm in the third grade reading on the second grade level while I balance my peers are reading um, on the third grade, then they were able to use that and have additional people within the school that will help that student not only from the learning ability but the other social aspects I think is a, is a huge piece so yeah that access to to resources was huge I mean you know they, they're putting a lot of eyes on them to see how successful it could become it's but I that. also think this is outside of a race thing too. It's just giving anyone that doesn't have access to quality education like we described before, yeah. to me, it's just a huge win. You're, you're opening up the doors in a number of ways. A, you know, not only are you providing the, the tools and the resources, right? That's one thing, yeah. but there's, to me, there's something behind like um, opening up a, an environment where a family unit could grow mm -hmm. and learn together, yeah. opening up a space where kids who are in like situations um, you're not getting picked on. There is no bullying. And hopefully, hopefully, you know, but kids yeah, find, a find a way. Yeah, kids <laughs> find a way to fight. Uh, yeah. But at least creating that opportunity was was interesting. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Like, being a parent of uh, someone with a disability and thinking about education, 
how how does that not saying keep you up at night, but how does that motivate you to, to make certain choices and decisions? Is it because I couldn't imagine what there's you have a, to go through to? There's a lot more partnership with the teaching staff. Okay. So like we have regular meetings with the principal, his teacher, a special education teacher. Um, I actually switched into full-time real estate so that I could volunteer sometimes at the school okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and play a more active role. So I you had, can't take a hands-off approach? No, really no, you really can't be hands-off. Um, from a different perspective, he um, he was in summer school this summer because he's behind and they recommended it. And he said, it's a good thing, then he won't be even further behind when he starts up into third grade, so we'll do summer school. So I went to those meetings. And it was very evident that the majority of the kids in summer school were from disadvantaged families whose parents were not playing an active part either because they couldn't themselves because they don't speak English or don't know how to teach their kids or don't have that education themselves to be able to teach even at an elementary school age level or because they just don't, you know. So to look, it was very eye-opening, you know, even in our bubble. You know, we live in a bubble. <laughs> yeah. um, to see the disparity between the kids who are doing well and then a lot of the kids that aren't doing well and the backgrounds that they're coming from. Um, but yeah, to have a, a child of any sort that has a learning disability um, and who hates school. I mean, you can't make a child love school when they're not really wired for it. <laughs> it takes a lot more effort. So from the teachers, a lot more effort and from the parents, a lot more effort. So him taking in kids that are uh, struggling and behind um, is admirable. It will be really interesting to see if they can catch up and even surpass, you know, because I, my son and daughter are only nine months apart in age. So I have one child that's on track and one child that's a little bit behind. He made up a huge, he made a huge amount of grounds this past year in reading and now he's on par for reading, but he's still a year and a half behind in math. You know, so there's always going to be something mm -hmm. that he's struggling with and that's different. So to put a lot of kids in that scenario, just because they have that in common, doesn't mean they all have that in common for the same yeah. reason. Yeah. I mean, the kids that my son, a lot of the kids that were in summer school this summer, their parents are um, Somali refugees. So mom and dad don't speak English. Mm -hmm. Mom's not permitted to get a job. Dad's working hard to support this big family, and so there's nobody to help this kid with homework mm -hmm. or help them learn English other than the limited services that they get at school. Um, it's just, it'll be interesting to see what all the different scenarios are and if they were truly picked at random or if they were yeah. a little bit more picked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, it's crazy when you think about, um, and I kind of often think about it from a career standpoint, if money wasn't an issue, if money, would I be doing the job that I'm doing, right? So I, I would use the correlation of for these, these children, not to say that they still won't have barriers or obstacles that they have to overcome, but I think we could all agree that what LeBron in partnership with the foundation and um, the city of Akron are trying to do are significantly take away a lot of those barriers. I mean, to the point that they're even running a food pantry from the school. So we're gonna take care of all your meals while you're here from nine to five. And then we're also gonna make sure that you have groceries when you go home. Yeah. Um, so it, it truly is, uh, I'll, I'll kind of think about it. This reduces any potential stress burdens that not only the student, but the family could face, right? So now all I have to really worry about is learning. Um, I don't have to worry about, I'm, I'm really trying not to pay attention because my stomach is growling. Um, or I, I have different needs and abilities and these teachers don't get me because they, they built a staff that has the ability and the competency and the skill set to support all of these different students' needs. Because to Alicia's point, every child is different and every child's needs are different. And I think having that type of approach and the overall commitment to, I think it was something, and it's it's funny that they, um, it's a pre-recorded thing, but when you miss a couple of days of school, you get a phone call from LeBron. Now granted, it's not LeBron calling in real time, but it's a pre-recorded message from LeBron oh, saying, yo, where you at? Miss school. Um, <laughs> but equally, 
when you do really good on activity, right? You pass it, you do really well on that test. You get a pre-recorded call from LeBron saying, "Hey, way to go, champ! Good job! Keep up the good work." So I think I think there's there's the right balance of incentives as well as truly addressing all of the variables. Because I think to your point, the access to learning is there, but you can't fully take advantage of the access unless your other needs are being met. And to the Basically. best of their ability, they're trying to take care of those basic needs as well. So that while you are at school and you're in this building, you can focus solely on, and we're, we're committed to you and your family. So we wanna make sure that while you are doing well, we're supporting your family in this transition and journey as well, which I think is huge. Yeah, that hope is huge, that hope. Yeah. And opportunity mm -hmm. it's just spark, spark. And um, confidence. Yeah. Like, it takes somebody from being embarrassed because you behind the class, you don't understand what's going on to like now, everybody's around you just like you and you're giving the tools to be successful. Like that's that's super dope to me. Yeah. I was just trying to understand and you might help me with this. Is there a difference with someone who has the basic needs but there's a learning disability? Um, like it, I'm not sure if your son has a learning versus someone who doesn't have the learning disability but doesn't have the basic basic needs. Is there like a similarity? I or think there can be. Okay. Um, my son is uh, like I think his doctor called him super ADHD. Okay, <laughs> so he's just super hyperactive. Mm -hmm. um, and cognitively, he's a little bit immature, which means he's just behind, mm -hmm. like, maturity-wise from the other kids. Um, and so he's on medication to help with his um, ADHD and to help him focus. But a kid who's hungry can have the exact, can exhibit the exact same behaviors mm -hmm. as a kid who has ADHD. I mean, yeah. not focused and, and just losing it and not being able to keep control of their temper, it can all rear its ugly head in the exact same way. And that's kind of what I wanted to pull out. That comparison, it being centered in the environment that school is placed in. Yeah. You know, you sit in a desk, because, uh, uh, I mean, back in the, that day, I, they, you would say I had ADHD, but mm -hmm. my mom just called me, and just, she just, you just get a whooping, because you just get <laughs> attention. But, but in that type of learning environment where for X amount of hours, I'm sitting, mm -hmm. I'm listening, and I, I was pretty bright. I could catch on fast, and my problem is once I learned it, I wouldn't pay no more attention mm -hmm. to you, because I know the rest of the class is you trying to teach me X plus Y, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get what you're saying. So now I'm goofing all yeah. because, okay, I get it. So, you know, that, I wanted to get a better understanding of that being placed in this, in an environment. Probably some of those kids that he handpicked are behind because of all the outside factors and they're actually incredibly sparky mm -hmm. kids yeah. and they just need this opportunity. Yeah. Like, I think my son is an incredibly smart kid. He has street smarts. My daughter, not so much. Okay, <laughs> she's got book smarts. Um, I think every kid has just a different set, of, a different toolkit they've been given to work with, yep. and so it's just figuring out which tools need sharpened in the toolkit mm -hmm. and how to do that for each kid, which is going to be. A, I mean, when you take 240 kids who have been labeled as either special needs or needing an individualized education plan or at risk, and then even if you bring in the most well-equipped teachers in that entire district, you are giving them all of the troubled cases, yeah. and you can give them every advantage possible, but it doesn't mean that they will take hold yeah. of every advantage. My, I'll go back to my mom. She was the elementary school teacher, and there were lots of kids that she had who were hyperactive and needed to be medicated. Like the doctor even said they needed to be medicated, but the parents were in denial. My kid doesn't need medicine to focus, blah, blah, blah. And my mom would go to those parents and say, can I give them a little bit of Mountain Dew in the morning? Because caffeine can have the reverse effect on elementary age school kids and it can actually calm them down. And they would say, oh yeah, give them some Mountain Dew, <laughs> you know, but wouldn't give them any medication to calm them down. So my mom would get them through reading with a swig of Mountain Dew, you know, but. That's brilliant to even know that. Yeah, <laughs> well, it was out of necessity. She wasn't mm -hmm. gonna get through to any of those kids. And she was the third grade teacher in charge of making sure they passed those state tests. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't pass those state tests, then resources, resources yeah. got cut. Like there was a lot of pressure. 
<laughs> there's a lot of pressure on a third grade teacher yeah. to perform. Yeah. I saw it this past year with my daughter, those third grade teachers, second mm -hmm. grade, first grade's all fun and mm -hmm. games and singing and, and you get to third grade yeah. and it is <laughs> it is business. You watch it shift mm -hmm. very quickly. So it's gonna be an interesting year for my son who's going into third grade this year. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing we hadn't even hit on yet, I know kind of wrapping up in a few minutes is the role of labels so like if you're labeled high risk you're labeled mm -hmm. adhd are you do you think do you perform at what you're labeled or do you think beyond that because i will tell you for me um very early i wouldn't say i was identified as academically gifted but <laughs> very early on my dad and my teachers kind of said robert's pretty smart and we're going to challenge him right so I acted out in class by talking because I was just bored, right? So they started to increase my workload and I'm not as bored anymore. But I lived up to that label of being smart. So I pushed myself because, hey, I'm smart. They told me I'm smart. This is before I even knew that, I'm, right? So I, I wonder what role, if I'm told I'm at risk, I'm told I'm dumb, I'm told I'm never gonna be nothing, I'm told whatever I'm told, Am I living up to what people are telling me I am? Or do I have the ability to blind that out and cancel out that noise and focus on truly what my abilities truly are and can be? I think you have to have some serious cheerleaders telling you the opposite of all the negative yeah. labels. And what you said earlier is funny too because the education system doesn't, they neutralize all attendees, which is can you take them, where are you reading, math, Right, but it doesn't, it, they don't dig into your learning style mm -hmm. and your learning ability. And if you don't perform on these, with these, these this neutralized model, then you become at risk. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not that I, I can't learn, it's just I don't learn in that style. Well, you don't learn in the style that we've created. So now you're at risk and now you're, you're to me, you're discarded. It, not discarded like we don't want anything to do with you, but it's, you go down a path, but it's the, it's the law of averages, right? Yeah. So if you think about it, um, just a general normalized bell mm -hmm. curve, right? Typically, those that fall within that 80 percentile fall within those normal learning abilities, right? So I'm gonna build a curriculum that supports that 80. Then I have that 10 percent that's gonna be above the the normalization curve that they're gonna get and they're gonna be more well you know, academically gifted, and we give them a little bit of work. It's that 10% that lags behind, and not even just solely that 10%, but those that are within that 80%, but on the back end of that curve, that sometimes get lost. And I think to Alicia's point earlier, typically, and I, this has zero to do, in my opinion, at this point, with whether they're impoverished or not, or have access to different educational ex opportunities, but even if I'm a private school that has the ability to individualize learning, do I want to take the risk on that 10% that behind the bell curve or even those that are just on the cusp for falling in? Because to at least a point, it's gonna mess up my numbers. I could help you out, but is the return on investment <laughs> worth me? It's, it's only worth my merit if your parents are making a big donation. <laughs> We're gonna pay for this new library extension. We're gonna pay for whatever. Yeah, then the return on investment is there because even if you don't pan out and you aggregate the numbers one way or another, we've justified it because we've been able to take care of this other thing. Yeah, um, yeah. But again, I, 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 I can't be mad at a school system building a curriculum that covers eight out of 10 students, knowing that, yeah, you might have one that doesn't get it and one that's gonna be bored. I can get with that one, but am I willing to sacrifice the nine that will over the one that can't? And unfortunately, that one that can't, more often than not, typically has some consistent variables associated with them. Well, and the one that cannot has to have a parent advocate. Otherwise, you will get nothing from the public school system. So like I spend the first two years of my son's elementary school years just 
borderline harassing educators to make sure he got tested so that he could get an individualized education plan so he could get the extra help that he needs. And that's in a good school district. I can't even imagine what it would be like in a school district that has out of the out of the hundred percent, they got fifty percent falling behind. I can't even imagine. What and that, that and that's <laughs> even to give you credit though, you have the awareness to know even to advocate on your child's mm -hmm. behalf. What if you have a parent that doesn't even know that that's an option? Yeah. Like the they don't she, it. Yeah, he, <laughs> he or she may not have finished school themselves or they barely got through. So they're they're not not to say that they don't love their child any less than you love your child. It's just they don't know that those resources or opportunities are even at their disposal. Yeah. Um, so then you, you can see how legacy over legacy, year over year, students get left behind, no pun intended. Um in communities aren't able to. So it goes back, the value of education then becomes really, really important because without that piece, the road ahead to truly change the narrative of yourself and your family going forward, because you're gonna repeat the behaviors that you know, in my opinion. So good conversation, lots of technical glitches for those that uh, try to watch on the Facebook Live. It's a learning process, you know. Um, hopefully, Brian, when you're editing this, you can make it look a little better for the YouTube. Uh, kids shaking their head like Rob, stop talking. But um, appreciate y'all. In two weeks, we'll be back. Um, so if there's a conversation um, that you want to bring to the table, definitely let us know. Alicia, thank you. Thank you for coming. Definitely appreciate oh, just one of you. No, it was great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as always, thank you, and talk to you soon.